So welcome. Uh, my name is Justin Carlson. I'm an emergency physician and member of the First Aid Task Force for the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, or ILCOR. And today I have the privilege of being joined by two members of our neonatal task force, uh, Dr. Myra Wyckoff, Chair, and Dr. Jonathan Wiley, Vice Chair of the Neonatal Task Force. Thank you both for joining today. So 2020 is a big year for ILCOR. We have a, a lot of things that are happening. Uh, and I wanted to give each of you an opportunity to talk a little bit about some, some things that might be new to the task force in 2020. And then we'll spend a little bit of time in the middle, kind of the second half of the interview, talking about some of the PICOs, some of the questions that have been looked at. But let's start first, what's new for the task force for 2020? One of the newest things is the use of the continuous review of the yeah. neonatal resuscitation literature. And um, this really allowed us to bring focus on questions where new evidence had been published that was critical for us to examine for its impact on what we recommend. And then we also had these different strategies for other evidence reviews um, where we knew we had new trials, we could undergo a formal systematic review with meta-analysis, or if it was just a hot topic, but we didn't, weren't aware of big trials, we could do scoping reviews or um, an evidence update, um, which really allowed us to, to tailor the kinds of reviews we were doing with the available science. So that was, that was pretty new for us. Um, we were constantly searching PubMed um, each month for any new literature, and we could really focus on the questions where we felt like we were gonna have an impact because there was actually new science to, to look at. Um, so I think that provided us that ability to focus the precious resource of time on the kinds of questions um, that the clinicians at the bedside wanted answered because there was new science to look at. Oh, well, I'd, I'd agree entirely with that. It's nice when we come up with the same things, but we've always had a slightly different way of doing things in the um, NLS task force as, as opposed to the other groups in that we have a, a very collegiate approach. So we still had the old way of um, quite a lot, uh, a wider group, 50 people feeding into the task force uh, and developing PICOs and categorizing them by priority. But just as Myra said, I think we've been able to blend that with the new approach whereby some of those priorities can change reasonably suddenly with new literature um, becoming available. And that triggers things like the systematic reviews. Um, but we've also wanted to uh, deal with a breadth of topics because we're, we're quite well aware of where this evidence evaluation ends up, which is back throughout the world in guidelines. And therefore, we've got, as Myra mentioned, the scoping reviews and the evidence updates to really cover as wide a range of areas as possible. So with that in mind, what were some of the new insights in 2020 compared to last year or previous years? Well, I think um, some of the, the questions that we really looked at intensely with systematic review and meta-analysis provide us with some new insights. Um, one of the big ones that is that we got reassurance from um, the newest body of literature that has been published since 2015 that um, no longer routinely suctioning non-vigorous meconium-stained infants um, still is... Um, the literature supports that recommendation, which was a big change in 2015. And I think people across the world appreciated the change, but were still a little nervous because it wasn't based on um, a large number of studies. And since 2015, we've had additional randomized controlled trials and the bulk of that evidence continues to support that this practice should no longer be um, done as a routine. So I think that was, so just some very nice reassurance um, that we needed for our clinical colleagues. I think you're right on both that, and I think you're going to mention oxygen, but both those processes, I think when there was some literature coming up that, that just rocked people's confidence, often observational or retrospective data, um, putting the, the whole PICO again through a proper process was able to give um, a robust reassurance uh, behind the guidelines. And it did make us all look at things again. Hey, Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and address the, the oxygen piece? Because that, that's a very controversial area within neonatology. And I think another very important review that was done where we got some additional insights. 
we had, and I think that that is a key one because that was really triggered having done it last time in 2015 by new evidence and also an awareness that that evidence, uh, despite to be fair, what the authors had said in terms of caveats was actually changing practice. And that was um, for us, that, that was the Torpedo 2, two trial. Um, which had actually been stopped for reasons of futility and therefore did not achieve the, the numbers that it, it required. And, and however, the um, subgroup analyses, which were, were not even secondary analyses, um, were changing practice and then that therefore made us look at this and decide that we had to do this again. And I think it was um, a fantastic experience, especially working with uh, evidence experts, because this went through a full um, systematic review uh, and finding what non-neonatologists viewed what were well set up, randomized control trials, but how they viewed them in terms of the, the bias. And we were able to um, reanalyze all the data and also do, uh, I think, what was a pretty telling and powerful sensitivity analysis by just seeing what the outcome would have been if the trial that had been stopped early had actually gone to fruition uh, and had recruited and got the same outcome. And, and that gave us a very robust um, answer. Uh, it, it, we already knew the answer for term, but it also gave us a robust answer for preterm babies. And I think that was pretty vital. It also showed major gaps in our knowledge, and we'll perhaps come on to talk about that later because there are significant gaps. I think that's a really interesting question and, and very telling findings. And so I just, I wanted to just make it a little bit more concrete for folks. So what of those, of that finding specifically with related to oxygen, how do you think that might change care that's delivered at the bedside and, and advance our, our knowledge, uh, really move the needle when it comes to patient care? So I, I, th I think it's going to, uh, for preterm babies, the initial starting ox oxygen concentration is going to be pinned back to um, a, a choice of, of a range between air and 30%, um, because that's where the evidence is. There are lots of people that, that uh, um, because of, of um, observational studies and cohort studies, are a little uncomfortable with that, but the evidence that's out there really just concentrates on air to 30% or um, greater than 60%. I think that um, people are probably going to choose to um, uh, opt. Th those that were uh, keen on a higher percentage are probably going to be starting at 30. Those that are, are uh, keen on air will continue doing that. But I think it does also add weight to the need to both find out um, whether there's an advantage to certain groups of, of, of premature infants or of um, oxygen, saturate, oxygen concentrations in the middle, somewhere between 30 and 60, because we have no data on that, no, no data we can put, put into this kind of review. And also, I think it's going to um, promote research into what are the the saturations that we should be aiming for with our premature babies. And that's a, another um, gap that was made uh, even more obvious by the, um, by the review that was uh, undertaken. You know, I think of it from a resource utilization standpoint that, you know, we think of high oxygen or, or room air or low, lower O2 saturation, low, lower uh, oxygen percentages. And that if I remember correctly from reading the systematic review, outcomes were better with the room air to 30%. And so that's absolutely true for term babies. For term babies, okay. So for term babies, I don't think there is really any argument. This has gone through two iterations and it's the same answer each, each time. Um, the, 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 for preterm babies, no, there is, is, is no major advantage um, in terms of, of mortality as there is in term babies. But we have in, in, within neonatology significant worries that I think actually also pediatricians and adult physicians uh, are starting to share about high concentrations of oxygen for too long. Uh, and for our babies, the premature babies, they have particular susceptibilities which we need to bear in mind. Myra, I wanted to turn back a little bit to, so, so these are a couple of really big topics and, and really impactful work. Um, which of the co-stars that, that you and your team looked at this year in 2020, which, which did you think were some of the most important or which was the most important one for you to publish and, and get out there and, 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 and share with the scientific and the medical community? 
Well, I think we had, it's hard to, to prioritize one as the one, but I, I, I'll share one that I think is really interesting and that will possibly change practice some, for some people. Um, and that's really, we took a deep dive into looking at how um, the failure to achieve return of spontaneous circulation, despite 10 to 20 minutes of intensive resuscitation, how that was associated with um, risks of mortality or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment among survivors. Um, for a long time, we've had um, a question where we, uh, a PICO question where we were looking for the science for how did babies do if their APGAR score was zero at 10 minutes? And we really changed up the question this time to look at not a, a specific cutoff, but if we could look at all the literature to say the longer you go, what are the um, risks for mortality and, and neurodevelopmental impairment? And from that, um, what we find from the literature that's available is that if despite the provision of all the prior recommended steps of resuscitation, and if you exclude reversible causes, a newborn who's undergoing CPR after birth, um, we probably should start discussing discontinuation of resuscitative efforts with the clinical teen fam family somewhere around 20 minutes. Um, if you haven't had any responses by then, um, the outcomes after 20 minutes are concerning enough that we really need to start having those conversations about the potential of, of redirecting the resuscitative efforts. And that, that's quite a big change because before I think we kind of said, oh, if your APGAR score is zero at 10 minutes, you need to start talking about it. But we've had some major therapeutic interventions that have had impact on outcomes in the last decade, the primary one being therapeutic hypothermia. And when we look at the literature of the survivors of CPR who've undergone therapeutic hypothermia in the neonatal population, there are survivors that have reasonable outcomes, um, even with longer periods of resuscitation. And so we're just, we're trying to balance that risk of ceasing resuscitation too early when ROSC and long-term survival may still be achievable, but yet continuing resuscitation, you know, wanting to balance that with making sure we don't go too long when the, if we get ROSC, survival is going to definitely be associated with neurodevelopmental impairment. And so um, I think it's a really thoughtful um, review and I'm sure it will raise lots of questions and discussion, but I think that's a good thing. So I, I'd agree with that, uh, absolutely. And I, I would just plead with people not to just fix on the fact that we, that as they did previously, about 10 minutes, and fix on the 20 minutes, but just look, as Myra has said, at all of the wording that we put in there. Because I, I think although some of that's going to annoy people and frustrate them, I think it is truly worthwhile. We have tried to make um, uh, a useful um, document from the evidence that's available for people to take wherever they are in the world and think about how these things really work out in their healthcare care setting and with their set of beliefs and resources. Uh, and as an international group, ILCOR, ILCOR can't do a one-size-fits-all in all situations, not in, not in situations like this. And I think that this um, uh, document in terms of um, duration of resuscitation and the impact is actually a much, much better um, outcome than we've ever had before in this area. Um, always it's going to, there's going to be compromise, but people should look on that compromise and think, why have we compromised and what does the evidence actually say? Well, and as an emergency physician, you know, I look at the work that, that each of you did with the, the task force. I mean, that's very impactful. For, it's a very challenging situation to begin with and having some guidance based on the best evidence that's out there and saying, look, we, we're, we're we're putting this together. It may differ based on the resources that are available there, but that, that kind of statement and putting that information together is really helpful as a frontline provider taking care of, you know, thankfully it's not very often, but there are situations where we, we do have uh, situ individuals in those, in those positions and having that kind of evidence behind some of those decisions is really helpful, especially in those critically ill, very young patients. So I appreciate the work that each of you and the task force did with that. I, I wanted to close with 
one more uh, question, just kind of looking, we, we've talked about some of the major changes, uh, whether that's oxygen or timing, but what, what of, the, uh, of the PICOs, of the questions that have come up, which ones maybe aren't changing treatment? Uh, meaning that we've, we've gone through the evidence and hey, this is staying the way it is. There might be thoughts of one way or another, but actually we're sticking with this because the evidence still supports X, Y, or Z. And anything from the task force uh, related to that? So actually, um, a lot of our algorithm is not changing. There's some stability there, even though we have new and better, higher grades of science to support the recommendation that science has not led us to a change, particularly on the initial steps of neonatal resuscitation. And we have a huge focus, particularly in preterm babies, but really for all babies, about providing warmth and keeping thermostability. And all, we have various strategies that can be utilized depending on your resources, et cetera. And, and those, we didn't find any science that would warrant a change in those recommendations. Additionally, if in the rare instance where um, positive pressure ventilation doesn't reverse um, bradycardia for a newborn, and we have to actually do cardiac compressions, um, again, the, how we do cardiac compressions, the ratios, the rhythm, the counts, the depth of compression, we didn't find any new science to warrant um, changing the, um, how we do cardiac compression. So that won't be changing either. You have to just remember that uh, un certainly unlike the adult situation, most of, of what we do and, um, and um, many more babies need um, help, uh, but most of that help does not ever get to compression. So that's a relatively rare event. And therefore getting any, any sort of data that is human is almost unheard of in, in, in our um, world. Uh, so a, a lot of it is um, we're look, looking at, at either mannequin studies or th thinking about the, the uh, duty cycle uh, and what it means. Uh, and again and again, when we've looked at CPR, um, we've worried about the effect on ventilation, which is the one thing that we really know does make a major difference to our population. Um, and so lots of things like that and where we've done sc scoping studies, uh, scoping reviews or evidence updates, lots of those things will stay the same as previously. But sometimes with the scoping reviews uh, and certainly suctioning of clear um, fluid is one of those things, um, they've prompted the, the need for us to think about a, a future systematic review. Well, thank you both. Really appreciate being able to talk, hear some of the insights uh, from you two as chair and vice chair of the neonatal task force uh, and get some insights about, you know, some things that are changing and, and some things that are being reaffirmed now with higher level of evidence. So thank you to both, both of you for leading that for everything that your task force is doing um, and really appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights with us. Thanks, Justin. Enjoy Thanks it. very much indeed, Justin.